you for the opportunity to uh, visit uh, once again this magnificent uh, country. Uh, I, nowadays, it's fashionable to start with a disclosure slide. So here's my uh, disclosure slide. But I, I want to, in particular, point out that, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, that I have been on the Lilly Board of Directors uh, for the past uh, 10 years. And I know I'm in the land of Novo Nordisk. Uh, and as you probably know, uh, Lilly and Novo Nordisk are arguably the, the two most valuable pharmaceutical companies uh, in the world currently, uh, at least according to investors. And we certainly talk about Novo Nordisk at our board meetings, and I suspect once in a while you talk about Lilly at your board meetings. Uh, but I'm here to tell you, I can assure you, I think there's room for both of these companies because my girlfriend lives on the Upper West Side of New York in a very fashionable neighborhood, and she sent me this uh, picture. Now, if you look closely, this should be like pizza slices, this should be bagels. Uh, but apparently this, this pharmaceutical, this pharmacy was bragging that they actually had both Ozempic and Mongero. So, so come on in. So that's the world we're now uh, living in. Uh, I should also say that I've been told that some of my best talks are talks I've given in Europe uh, for the simple reason that like a lot of New Yorkers, I have a tendency to speak too quickly, especially when I'm getting excited. Uh, but jet lag slows me down quite a bit. And I'm happy to report I'm really like jet lagged out of my mind. So if I really start blabbering, I'm just going to take this cold water over here and pour it over my head. But hopefully we'll make it through. So here are the people who've worked in my lab on von Hippel-Lindau disease over the years. And uh, I'll try to mention a few individuals as I go along. And here are, are uh, is a par very partial list of the collaborators who have been helping us with some of the unpublished work I'm going to share with you uh, today. So I had the good fortune of uh, training as a clinical doctor. I'm trained in internal medicine and in clinical oncology. Uh, and then I had the very good fortune of training with the, the late uh, David Livingston, a wonderful physician scientist who really trained me uh, to be a scientist, despite my rather low expectations at the time that I could be a scientist. Uh, and so I had studied the retinoblastoma tumor suppressor gene in David's lab and, and, and had some success. And then I started my own laboratory in Boston uh, in 1992. And shortly thereafter, uh, this paper crossed my desk, which was the uh, identification and cloning of the so-called von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor gene. So this is the gene that, went, that when mutated in the germline, gives rise to a hereditary cancer syndrome called von Hippel-Lindau. Uh, disease. And I immediately thought this was the perfect thing for us to work on. First, I had already worked on one tumor suppressor gene, namely the retinoblastoma gene. So I thought some of the paradigms we'd used there would apply themselves well to the VHL tumor suppressor gene. But I also knew from my clinical features, I, I knew from my clinical training that some of the clinical features seen in VHL disease uh, strongly hinted that the VHL gene product must play a role in oxidant sensing, as I'll get to uh, in a minute. So what do these families look like? So here are some uh, families with von Hippel-Lindau disease that have been followed at the National Cancer Institute over the years. Uh, as you might uh, imagine, each filled circle or square is an individual uh, that's developed a, a cancer in this family. And the hallmark cancers seen in this syndrome are uh, kidney cancer, and in particular, clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which is the most common form of kidney cancer by far. Uh, blood vessel tumors called hemangioblastomas, uh, and uh, neurocrescent tumors called paragangliomas, which when they arise in the, in the adrenal gland are called uh, pheochromocytomas. Uh, so I thought, uh, if nothing else, by studying the VHL gene, we'd learn something about the pathogenesis of, of kidney cancer, and kidney cancer is one of the 10 most common cancers uh, in the developed world. Uh, I also thought we'd learn something about angiogenesis, because as, as I said, hemangioblastomas are proliferations. Uh, of new uh, blood vessels. Now, uh, many of you, and looking at these kindreds, would say, well, this looks like an autosomal dominant disorder. Uh, it's happening generation after generation. But in fact, uh, at the molecular level, it's actually caused by a recessive mutation. So individuals with von Hippel-Lindau disease have inherited a defective uh, copy of the VHL gene from mom or dad. In this schematic, it's the maternal copy. But initially, they're OK, because they have the remaining wild-type allele from the other parent. But unfortunately, if you're born with a, a, a VHL mutation, you have a 90% chance that at least one susceptible cell in, the, in your body, such as in the kidney, brain, or eye, will spontaneously lose the remaining wild-type allele. And that's the cell that will go on to form a tumor. And as you would predict from the knowledge that germline VHL mutations predispose to, for example, clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which again is the most common form of kidney cancer, uh, 
Uh, you again see that both the maternal and the paternal copies of the VHL gene have frequently been mutated or lost. But here, both mutational events, or hits if you will, have occurred sometime after conception, in contrast to VHL disease, where the first hit has occurred in the germline. So this is a so-called Knudsen 2-hit tumor suppressor gene. Now, even though from this, you would argue that inactivation of the VHL gene plays a critical step in the development of a, of a clear cell renal cell carcinoma, it's not sufficient. And we know that because even in the VHL patients, it takes decades for them to develop these tumors. And in those tumors, there are additional uh, cooperating genetic events. And you can also see this in sporadic tumors. So here I'm showing you an example of a patient uh, that was uh, studied by Charlie Swanton and co-workers. So what they've done is to take uh, different kidney tumors, they do multiple spatially distinct biopsies, and then do deep sequencing of those biopsies. And they use the mutant allele frequencies to infer the evolutionary history of those tumors. And so almost invariably, they see that the initiating event is loss of the VHL gene, uh, but then there are these additional cooperating mutations that occurred over time. And you can also see that some of these mutations occur in a subclonal fashion or so-called branching pattern in contrast to loss of uh, the VHL gene, which as I said, is usually the initiating event and is the so-called uh, gatekeeper or truncal uh, event. Uh, now, I knew from my uh, clinical training that the tumors linked to uh, or seen in these VHL uh, kindreds were highly rich in blood vessels. Uh, I mentioned the hemangioblastomas, but kidney tumors are also notoriously rich in blood vessels. And that's because these tumors occasionally overproduce vascular endothelial growth factor. And another curiosity about these tumors is that they occasionally stimulate excess red blood cell production. And that's because these tumors sometimes ectopically produce erythropoietin. And what VEGF and erythropoietin have in common is that they're normally induced when cells or tissues are not getting enough uh, oxygen. Uh, now, many of these uh, oxygen-regulated genes are under the control of a uh, transcription factor that was introduced to you a moment ago called hypoxia-inducible factor, or HIF for short. And we knew from the work of many laboratories, including the work of my fellow uh, laureates, Peter Radcliffe and Greg Semenza, that the alpha subunit was normally degraded when oxygen was present, hence the hypoxia inducibility. Whereas the beta subunit, which is often referred to by the alternative name of ARNT, is constitutionally uh, stable. Uh, and based on uh, th that knowledge, our group and several others went on to show that the VHL protein is part of a so-called ubiquitin ligase complex that in the presence of oxygen directly binds to the HIF alpha subunits and targets them for proteasomal degradation. Whereas when oxygen levels are low or the VHL protein is, has been mutated, now HIF alpha can accumulate and dimerize with its partner protein uh, ARNT and activate genes such as VEGF and EPO. Uh, so, so that was very satisfying. So now we can understand why VHL defective tumors would uh, overproduce hypoxia inducible gene products such as VEGF and EPO. But it begged the question how does the VHL protein know, if you will, whether oxygen is or is not available? and hence uh, whether it should or should not uh, d destroy HIF alpha. And, and the answer that we arrived at and that uh, Peter Radcliffe arrived at working independently and in parallel is that in the presence of oxygen, one of two prolyl residues in HIF alpha gets hydroxylated, uh, and this then uh, generates uh, a high affinity VHL binding site. Uh, now, even I could see how this would be linked to oxygen availability because, uh, of course, you need th this oxygen atom, which tracer studies confirm is derived from ambient oxygen. Uh, the enzymes that do the work here are variably called the EGLN or PhD uh, prolohydroxylases. So they split the oxygen so they can hydroxylate HIF alpha. And uh, not shown here is that they have very low oxygen affinity. So they're very sensitive to changes in oxygen availability over a physiologically uh, relevant uh, range. Uh, these enzymes also have several other curious features. They require uh, reduced iron, which explains why when you add iron chelators to cells and culture, you will mimic a hypoxic response, and they require a cofactor from the Krebs cycle, which is variably called 2-oxoglutarate or alpha-ketoglutarate. Now, generically, these are uh, members of a broader superfamily of enzyme called 2-oxoglutarate-dependent uh, dioxygenases. So the, the enzymes that modify HIF are shown here. There are three of these enzymes, but the workhorse member of the family is Egalin-1. Uh, but there are a lot of other uh, enzymes in this superfamily, and I should point out, among them are the so-called Jumanji C uh, histone demethylases. And we and others have actually shown that some of these histone demethylases 
like the enzymes that modify HIF, are sensitive to changes in oxidant availability in a physiologically relevant uh, range. And so that provides another way for oxygen to signal to our cells by reprogramming the epigenome through uh, these uh, enzymes. Now, returning to this reaction, it almost immediately became clear that you could inhibit these enzymes with small organic chemicals with drug-like properties that were competitive with respect to 2 oxyglutarate or if you prefer alpha ketoglutarate and the idea was that with such uh, chemicals you could trick the body into thinking it was hypoxic you could stabilize HIF and so for example you could turn on the various genes devoted to red blood cell production by stabilizing HIF as you or I would do if we went to the top of uh, Mount Everest and so there are now uh, a number of these drugs in late stage clinical trials. Uh, here are four that uh, have advanced to at least phase three testing. I have a financial conflict of interest related to Roxadustat that was developed by a, a company called Fibrogen. Uh, so Roxadustat is now approved in 44 countries around the world. Unfortunately for me, it's not yet approved in the United States. Uh, the first of these to be approved in the United States is a, a drug called Daprodustat developed by GSK. So this is, again is an orally available drug that basically tricks the body into thinking it's gone to high altitude, HIF gets stabilized, you turn on things like erythropoietin and other genes dedicated to erythropoiesis. And so it turns out this is a way with an oral agent that you can help to correct anemia in settings uh, uh, such as chronic kidney disease where there's a relative deficiency of uh, EPO. Now it turns out every uh, metazoan that's been looked at on the planet has this same basic oxygen sensing mechanism involving VHL and HIF and at least one uh, prole hydroxylase and presumably that's because if you're a hypoxic cell or tissue you need a way to rapidly adapt to changes in oxygen and in particular a way to adapt to uh, a deprivation of of oxygen and so based on that reasoning we and many others have asked whether these HIF stabilizers might also be useful in diseases such as heart attack or stroke where there's a problem with oxygen uh, delivery uh, so, uh, in preclinical models, this is still uh, this is certainly the case, and I emphasize these are preclinical data. But just as an example, uh, here are data from uh, Ben Allenchuk when he was in my lab. Uh, what he's done here is, first of all, we're working with a tool compound from Fibrogen uh, that uh, again will inactivate the prolohydroxylases and stabilize uh, HIF. So here's a nice Western blot for HIF one alpha. We had also made a mouse, a reporter mouse, that ubiquitously expresses a HIF luciferase fusion protein. So uh, if you give these animals luciferin and then give the prolohydroxylase inhibitor, you can see HIF get stabilized uh, by virtue of this increase in light emission. But more importantly, on the right, uh, what Ben uh, also did was he ad administered this drug, and again, this is by oral gavage, and then he did experimental myocardial infarctions by tying off a coronary uh, artery uh, for a brief period of time. And on the y-axis is the amount of heart muscle damage uh, in the animals that got the placebo uh, versus the amount of heart muscle damage in the animals that got the HIF stabilizer. Now, I'll be the first to admit this works even better when you give the drug before the insult, but that's kind of cheating a little bit unless you go to the doctor and say, I think I'm going to have a heart attack in two hours. Uh, but this does still have a beneficial effect even if it's given uh, within the first couple hours. Uh, that, that's a pharmacological experiment. You can also do this genetically. <clears throat> so Ben also took advantage of mice that have a conditional Egolin 1 allele. Uh, that also have an inducible Cre recombinase that can be activated by tamoxifen. So here, rather than pharmacologically inhibiting the Egolin prolohydroxylases, he did it genetically. So he administered tamoxifen to inactivate the Egolin prolohydroxylases and again did experimental myocardial infarctions and uh, again saw substantial uh, protection. Now, uh, it's been known for years in the cardiovascular world that if a, if a heart uh, is able to survive an ischemic insult, and again, ischemia just refers to an interruption in the delivery of blood and hence oxygen, it, it becomes somewhat more resilient, at least for a period of time, in terms of its ability to withstand a subsequent ischemic uh, insult. Uh, so that's called ischemic preconditioning. But uh, I became aware of a, of a really, I, I thought, fascinating phenomenon called remote ischemic preconditioning. So this is the observation that, at least in animal models, if you make a particular uh, tissue or organ ischemic, uh, such as by occluding blood flow to a limb, uh, somehow that ischemic tissue can send signals to other organs and protect those other organs from ischemia. So again, this came to be known as remote ischemic preconditioning. 
Uh, now, I should hasten to point out, this phenomenon is quite robust in animal models. It's been seen in mice, rabbits, pigs, and in the laboratory, this is quite reproducible. In the clinic, however, this has been decidedly non-robust. In fact, there were several phase three trials a couple years ago where doctors purposely overinflated multiple times a blood pressure cuff uh, to cause limb ischemia and then did uh, elective heart surgery. And then they asked whether overinflating the blood pressure cuff multiple times had been useful for protecting the heart. And in those phase three trials, they could not demonstrate a benefit. Uh, but we thought, gee, that seemed kind of crude. That seems like a pretty crude uh, way to do this. And secondly, you know, without knowing the mechanism, you wouldn't know whether the other things you were doing, such as the anesthetics, might interfere with the mechanism. So we decided we would take this on and see if we could get to the mechanism for remote ischemic preconditioning. So the first set of experiments we did was to take uh, those mice with the conditional Egolin 1 allele, but now to cross them to a mouse that expresses the Cre recombinase only in the skeletal muscle, and in particular, not in the heart. And in the interest of time, I won't show you all the controls that show that's really true. So here what was done was to activate HIF in the skeletal muscle, thinking that that would be one consequence of limb ischemia. And then, uh, once again, Ben did experimental MIs, uh, and he could still see protection. And, and once again, I've told you the controls show that this is really uh, HIF activation restricted to the skeletal muscle. There's no evidence, for example, of HIF activation in the heart. So then the question was, well, okay, that's great, but is this a neural mechanism or a humoral mechanism? Uh, so here I have to ask the anti-vivisectionist in the room uh, to close your eyes, and we will tell you when you can open them. So what Ben and Javed Moslehi did was they did actual parabiosis experiments where in the donor uh, mouse, uh, the mouse either ha is wild type or the mouse is one of those mice where we can conditionally uh, inactivate Egolin 1 in the skeletal muscle and hence activate HIF in the skeletal muscle. But again, this is just in the donor mouse. And then they did experimental MIs in the so-called recipient mice. Uh, and this, uh, quite to my surprise, uh, worked also. So if, the, if you activate HIF in the donor mouse, uh, in the skeletal muscle of the donor mouse, you see pr protection in the recipient mouse, again, measured here where the y-axis is a measure of heart muscle damage. Now, since this work is uh, published, I'll just uh, tell you what we think is the, the, the underlying mechanism. So what Ben and his uh, co-workers did was they did um, uh, serum metabolomics, and what they found was what the, when you acutely inactivate Egolin 1, either genetically or pharmacologically, uh, there's an increase in circulating uh, alpha ketoglutarate, that, that cofactor that the enzymes are, are churning through ordinarily. Uh, and this increase in alpha ketoglutarate then drives a transamination reaction in the liver that leads to the production of kynurenic acid. And uh, the more we read about kynurenic acid, it turns out kynurenic acid had been identified as a uh, potential tissue protective factor in ischemia by others, uh, but the, the mechanism was, was obscure. Uh, ben went on to do both necessity and sufficiency experiments to show that at least in this admittedly contrived model, a kind neuronic acid actually was both necessary and sufficient for the protection. And then uh, more recently, a talented postdoc in the lab, Greg Wyant, wanted to know, but okay, but how does the kind neuronic acid work? We've just kicked the, the can down the road a little bit. So it turned out there were four or five candidate receptors for kind neuronic acid including this orphan uh, uh, receptor, this uh, G protein coupled receptor, GPR35. Uh, and what uh, Greg was able to show was that when kynurenic acid binds to this receptor, it's internalized, goes to the mitochondria, and then in an ATPIF1 dependent manner, uh, forces the dimerization of ATP synthase, which it turns out is critical during ischemia because unfortunately what can normally happen during ischemia is ATP synthase starts going in the wrong direction and futilely consumes ATP. But if you can make it dimerize, you prevent the futile consumption of uh, ATP. Okay, so that was my foray into the world of cardiovascular uh, medicine. Uh, now I'm gonna go back to uh, my day job, which is to be a cancer biologist and a, uh, and a, and a, a cancer uh, doctor. So I, sh I already showed you this, uh, but one of the things I like to talk to students about is you know, the, the difference in correlation and causation, and even when you have plausibility on your side, uh, you have to still do the experiments to formally prove causation. So it, it was certainly plausible that the cancers linked to VHL loss were driven by HIF. I mean, you could, that, that was easy to imagine. Uh, 
But if you were really being intellectually honest, you could have said, maybe there's some other substrate of the VHF protein you don't know about yet that's really causing the cancers. And HIF is simply a marker for the integrity of the VHL protein. So again, I used the word necessity and sufficiency uh, a moment ago. Maybe that's because I was trained in mathematics and philosophy. I think a lot about necessity and sufficiency. So we did the necessity and sufficiency experiments again. So we had shown years ago that if you restore the function of the VHL protein in a VHL defective renal carcinoma cell line, they lose the ability to form tumors. So Keiichi Kondo, when he was in the lab, took these cells and introduced into these cells a version of HIF-alpha uh, and in particular HIF2-alpha that can't be recognized by VHL because the proline hydroxylation sites have been co converted to alanine. And that allowed these cells to once again form tumors. So that said that downregulation of HIF2-alpha was necessary for VHL to suppress the growth of these tumors. And then in a complementary set of experiments, uh, Keiichi took these cells and he, he used short hairpin RNA technology to eliminate HIF2-alpha although we now do this with CRISPR, uh, and these cells uh, lost the ability to form tumors. And so that said, on one level, that loss of HIF2-alpha, or HIF2 activity, was actually sufficient to account for the tumor suppression by VHL. Now, as was already alluded to, uh, we were as surprised as anybody that the canonical well-studied HIF doesn't do this. HIF1-alpha, when tested in this way, has the diametrically opposite effect. And, and the answer to your question is no, we don't completely understand that yet. Uh, we used to say when I was a clinical doctor, there are lumpers and there are splitters. The lumpers put things together, the splitters split them. And so I would have liked to have said HIF-1 was HIF-2 effectively, so I could be a lumper. But here you have to be a splitter. They have somewhat different target genes and also they have some non-canonical functions. So here the difference matters. Now, what's not shown here, and I, I think I saw some young people here, I hope we have some young people, what's not shown here is your required reading, because I'm not, not only am I not showing you the raw data, uh, I'm not showing you any of the many controls you better do if you're going to do uh, these kinds of experiments. So your required reading uh, is this review article, uh, which I, I, I wrote after uh, seeing various artifacts and mistakes that sometimes uh, we all make if we're not being uh, careful. So this sort of outlines, uh, I think, some of the controls you might want to do. And although this is written about cancer targets, I can tell you 98% of what's in here would apply to any uh, therapeutic area. You know, thinking about correlation versus causation, necessity, sufficiency, up assays, down assays, et cetera, et cetera. So what can we do about this therapeutically? Well, by the 90s, we knew uh, in broad strokes that HIF regulated VEGF, and of course, VEGF had been well linked to angiogenesis. So a number of drug companies were already making VEGF inhibitors uh, and we argued that if these VEGF inhibitors were going to work in any cancer, they would work in kidney cancer because of this uh, intimate link between VHL loss, HIF activation, and consequently VEGF upregulation. So <clears throat> if you measure angiogenic factors across solid tumors, uh, kidney cancer is the 800-pound gorilla when it comes to VEGF levels, and predictably, it's being driven by VEGF. Whereas in many other tumors, uh, there's a whole chicken soup of different angiogenic factors that are being produce, and none of them have the VEGF levels you would see in a kidney cancer. So I'm happy to report that we're up to eight uh, VEGF inhibitors that are approved for the treatment of kidney cancer, uh, but uh, th that's the good news. The bad news is that not every patient with kidney cancer will respond to these agents, and even those that do will eventually progress, so we have to do better. So how could you do better? Well, based on uh, first principles, you would say, rather than targeting any one HIF target gene, maybe you should target HIF. And in particular, if you believe your own data, you should target, target HIF2. Uh, and uh, th that's all well and good. But uh, another sort of take-home message for the students is I can't tell you how many things I've heard in the last 30 years that I, where I was told this is impossible. It will never be done until some smart person came along and said you were wrong. So I heard for about 25 years that HIF, being a DNA-binding, sequence-specific transcription factor, would not be druggable. Uh, that it would lack the right sorts of nooks and crannies to be attacked with a drug. It certainly wasn't, for example, a member of the steroid hormone receptor where we leverage the fact that there's already a natural ligand pocket. But fortunately, two wonderful scientists, Kevin uh, Gardner and Rick Bruick, uh, ignored uh, that dogma, and they looked more carefully, and they identified a potentially druggable pocket in the so-called past B domain of HIF2-alpha, which is what I'm showing you here. They then did high-throughput screens uh, at UT Southwestern and identified chemicals that could bind to this pocket and in so doing induce an allosteric change such that HIF2-alpha would no longer bind to ARNT and hence no longer bind to DNA. Uh, and that was really amazing. 
Uh, having said that, my, my drug hunter f friends in industry tell me these chemicals were publication grade. They simply weren't pharmaceutical grade. These chemicals were going nowhere. They had too many blemishes and warts. But fortunately, the people at UT Southwestern outlicensed uh, some of their chemicals to a biotech company called Peloton uh, that was later acquired by Merck, and I again de declare a, a financial conflict of interest. Uh, and, the, and the people at Peloton were kind enough to provide us with a tool compound called PT2399 that was one or two atoms removed from what was then their lead compound. So uh, these wonderful medicinal chemists at Peloton improved all the properties of these chemicals. They improved their potency, their specificity, and bioavailability, and now we had the good fortune to have a tool compound from their series to play with. So uh, very quickly, uh, our lab and the lab of my former postdoc, Jim Brugerales, showed that these uh, first generation HIF2 inhibitors did everything you would dream about in preclinical models of VHL mutant kidney cancer. It lowered HIF-dependent uh, transcription, uh, lowered growth in soft agar, suppressed tumor growth in new mice, and so you go, Eureka, high five, let's start writing the paper, isn't this great? But I also like to remind students that you know, the most dangerous result in science is the one you were hoping for, because that's when you get a little mentally uh, lazy and you stop doing those extra controls. So what do I mean by extra controls? Well, for example, here's a soft agar assay that Chin Cho and my lab did. So this is a renal carcinoma cell line that lacks uh, a, a wild-type version of the VHL protein, and she treats with 0.2 or 2 micromolar of this tool compound that inhibits uh, HIF2. And you see a decrease in soft agar colonies, and you go, yeah, that's great. But first of all, what's not shown here is that uh, 10 to 20 micromolar, this compound will inhibit uh, any cancer cell line, even cancer cell lines that don't express HIF2. So right off the bat, you know, above 10 or micromolar, this is all off target. But even in this range, how would you formally know that this is on target, that it's specifically due to downregulation of HIF2? and not due to any of a number of off-target effects. Because I will also point out, this is a down assay where something fairly complicated is no longer happening as well. And there are lots of trivial ways to make a complicated thing work less well. And I pointed out, I could have done this with Clorox bleach. I could have done this with formalin. We don't just need another non-specific poison to give to our poor patients. We need something that's exquisitely targeted. And so the question was, how would you prove this is on target? And the way you prove it's on target is to do a rescue experiment. And here, we had to get a little bit fancy, but fortunately, Bruick and Gardner had already identified a point mutation in the HIF2-alpha past B domain that prevented the uh, drug from entering the pocket, but otherwise left HIF2-alpha uh, intact. So using CRISPR, uh, Chin actually generated isogenic renal carcinoma cell lines that either had wild-type HIF2-alpha or this HIF2-alpha uh, putative drug-resistant mutant. And now you can see that the cells that have the drug-resistant mutant uh, are completely insensitive. Uh, to the drug, at least in this concentration range. And although not shown here, uh, the cells expressing this mutant are no longer suppressed in orthotopic tumor assays. So we could really feel comfortable that this really was on target. So eventually, an approved version of this drug called uh, Belsudafan went into clinical trials in patients with advanced kidney cancer. These are so-called swimmer's plots, uh, where each horizontal bar is a patient on the trial on how long they were on therapy at the time of this analysis. So for orientation, here's one year on therapy. And the black arrows were patients continuing to do well at the time of this analysis. And the yellow starred patients had a resist, so-called resist partial response. Uh, and I should point out these patients were heavily pretreated. They had all failed at least one VEGF inhibitor, and in some cases, multiple VEGF inhibitors. And uh, I think three quarters of them had also uh, failed a so-called immune checkpoint uh, inhibitor. And so based on these uh, data, the drug went into phase three trials, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. So now what I'm going to do, uh, and uh, maybe, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, uh, I can tell you if you're fortunate enough to win the Nobel Prize, you spend a lot of time giving these rather historical talks because, you know, you have to dance with the one who brought you. So you give the talk, and you give the talk, and you give the talk. And I was getting to the point where my head was going to explode if I... And so that's why I gave the, sort of the contracted version of how, how we got there. Uh, but I wanted to get back to showing uh, unpublished data. Uh, but in fairness to myself, each of these is sort of a short vignette, so if you're not interested in this vignette, hold on for five or ten minutes and we'll get to another vignette. And in many cases, I purposely pick technologies where even if you're not interested in my questions, you might still be interested in the technologies because you could use it for your own questions. So uh, one of these sets of experiments was done by a postdoc in the lab, Nissan Shiroli. So Nissan wanted to ask the following question. So we know HIF2 regulates hundreds of genes. But for simplicity, I'll show you, we'll call four genes here, A, B, C, D. So the idea was you treat with the HIF2 inhibitor and you shut down the transcription 
of all these HIF2 responsive genes. But his question was, maybe some are more important than others in terms of the anti-proliferative effects of this drug. And if that was the case, and you could artificially reactivate these genes uh, one at a time uh, using CRISPR-A technology, you could start to ask whether some of these genes were more important uh, than others. And so that's what Nithin did. Now, I apologize. We're using a fairly uh, complicated and Baroque version. Uh, I didn't say broke, uh, Baroque. Uh, that's a word I learned from David Livingston. Uh, he used lots of fancy uh, dictionary words in front of me. So this is a complicated and Baroque. Uh, and this is a system developed by uh, John Dench. Uh, suffice it to say, you have a nuclease dead Cas9 that's now tethered to a transcriptional activation domain called BP64. But there, when it gets really complicated is they re-engineered the sgRNAs, so you now recruit some additional transcriptional activators. Uh, so again, I apologize it's so complicated, but it turns out it works very well and it's very robust. So uh, the experiment was to take a, a cell line that's been engineered to have all of that uh, molecular machinery I just introduced to you. Uh, this is a VHL defective renal carcinoma cell line that's uh, fairly sensitive to the HIF2 inhibitor. So this is the tool compound we like to use. And then he did a genome-wide CRISPR-A screen. Uh, and he, uh, after introducing the genome-wide CRISPR-A library, he treated the cells with DMSO versus the HIF2 inhibitor and then monitored the abundance of the guides at various time points by uh, next generation uh, sequencing. So uh, we love this technology for multiple reasons. In fact, I could give an entire research uh, seminar about all the different things it's taught us, and inc including things we, didn't, we weren't smart enough to anticipate. But I'll just, for today, I'll just show you one thing we learned. So on the right are genes that, when activated, confer relative resistance to the HIF2 inhibitor. On the left are genes that, when activated, actually uh, make the cells even more sensitive to a HIF2 inhibitor. Now, one thing that immediately caught our attention was uh, cyclin D1, uh, which was amongst the top 10 hits in the screen, because we've known for 25 years now that in kidney cancer, but in no other solid tumor, HIF actually induces cyclin D1 as opposed to repressing cyclin D1. So here's actually the obligatory CHIP-seq track showing you HIF2 bound to the cyclin D1 locus. Uh, parenthetically, there's a naturally occurring polymorphism in the human population at this site that influences the risk of kidney cancer. So that's a pretty good genetic smoking gun. Uh, here I'm showing you that if you measure cyclin D1 mRNA levels uh, in renal carcinoma cells treated with DMSO versus the HIF2 inhibitor, you do indeed lower cyclin D1. Uh, and then finally, for completely other reasons, we had already shown in orthotopic tumor assays uh, formed by another renal carcinoma cell line over here that it's true uh, there's a benefit to using the HIF2 inhibitor, and by the way, we're using submaximal doses of the HIF2 inhibitor here. Uh, but in red, we're treating the, the cells with a, CD, a clinical grade CDK4-6 inhibitor. Uh, again, there's a benefit. And uh, notably, if we combine the HIF2 inhibitor with a cyclin uh, D CDK4 inhibitor, uh, some of these animals are actually tumor free at necropsy. And again, I'll, I'll remind you, because I realize I'm slipping into specialty jargon here, uh, the catalytic partner for cyclin D1 is either CDK4 or CDK6. And fortunately for us, there are clinical grade inhibitors of CDK4 and CDK6. So uh, was this a true positive? The answer was yes. And just to show you how I think beautiful this technology is. So here uh, we're doing Western blots where the cell's got a control guide or one of two different activation guides for cyclin D1. The cells were then treated uh, with vehicle or with the HIF2 inhibitor, and uh, it's done Western blot. So here, as expected, uh, in the control cells, the HIF2 inhibitor lowers cyclin D1. Uh, but look, that in the presence of the CRISPR-A guides, we can sustain the expression. Uh, I'm always one for specificity controls. The specificity control is here. Here's another HIF2 target gene. Uh, you see it's not affected by the CRISPR-A guide, so this is really... Uh, specific. Uh, and now we can do uh, low throughput assays to see if this is really capable of overriding the HIF2 inhibitor. So again, I apologize for the busy slide, but these are proliferation curves. Uh, so the control here, the cells treated with DMSO. Uh, then we treat with the HIF2 inhibitor. You can see uh, there's a marked inhibition of proliferation. But now if you give the cells the cyclin D1 guides to activate and sustain cyclin D1 expression, they're, they're completely uh, insensitive. So we think there might be an analogy here between kidney cancer and, and breast cancer, because in breast cancer, you might know that the transcriptional driver of cyclin D1 is actually the estrogen receptor. And so in hormone-positive breast cancers, the standard of care is often to combine tamoxifen, which, is, which will lower the expression of cyclin D1, and then to combine it with one of these clinical-grade uh, 
CDK4-6 inhibitors. And so based on this analogy, we're thinking in kidney cancer, you should combine a HIF-2 inhibitor with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. So a clinical trial has begun to actually test uh, this concept. Okay, so I promised you I'd switch gears. We're going to switch gears. So another curiosity about kidney cancer is that it's known to be or believed to be highly immunogenic. The evidence for this is that sometimes patients undergo spontaneous regressions. That's well described. Uh, they have a conspicuously high uh, level of T-cell infiltration. Uh, in the old days, some patients were treated and on rare occasions cured with high doses of interleukin-2 or interferon, but this became so, th these therapies were so toxic they were later abandoned. And then finally, uh, this uh, tumor is often responsive to so-called immune checkpoint inhibitors such as uh, uh, the anti-PD-1 antibodies, the anti-CTLA-4 antibodies. Now, what intrigued us is, and some of you may have seen this graph before, uh, along the x-axis here, I'm showing you tumor types, and on the y-axis is a measure of the mutational burden in those tumors. And so uh, the 800-pound gorilla here is melanoma, and it's thought that that's probably one of the reasons why melanomas are very sensitive to immune checkpoint blockade, because it's a very rich source of neoantigens. Uh, but kidney cancer, uh, and again, we're talking about clear cell renal cell carcinoma, is smack dab in the middle. So this seemed like the unlikely explanation for why they would be so immunogenic. So we think uh, a, a hopelessly underappreciated uh, set of clinical observations were the clinical observations from Richard Childs and co-workers. So uh, what Richard did about 20 years ago, out of sheer desperation, he, he admitted to me, uh, he took 74 patients with uh, metastatic kidney cancer and he treated them with allogeneic stem cell transplants as a potential source for, for tumor reactive T cells. Uh, and uh, remarkably, about half the patients responded, including about 10 or 12% who had durable, complete responses. And in one of the complete responders, uh, they were able to show that the uh, donor T cells were recognizing a tenmer peptide derived from an endogenous retrovirus that was re-expressed in the kidney cancer. And they never found this endogenous retrovirus in any other uh, cancer type, and nor did they ever detect it in normal tissues. Moreover, some authors, but not all authors, have noted that the overexpression of endogenous retroviruses seems to at least correlate with the likelihood that a kidney cancer patient will respond to immune checkpoint blockade. Now, in the case of Richard Childs, they went on to show that this particular endogenous retrovirus was directly controlled by HIF-2. And, of course, now you're experts on HIF-2, so this will now, of course, strike you as a very satisfying explanation for why you would at least get overexpression of this ERV in, in the kidney cancers. So Chin Chin Jiang in the lab wanted to know, was this a one-off, was this a unicorn never to be seen again, or was this the tip of the iceberg? Should we have paid much more attention to this? So uh, Chin Chin had two hypotheses. One is that HIF drives the expression of multiple ERVs, uh, including the ERV derived by uh, or identified by Richard Childs, which is now called ERV4. And by the way, I, I apologize that the, the nomenclature in this field is awful, but that's what we're dealing with. Uh, and then our second hypothesis was that maybe some of these other ERVs are like the Richard Childs ERV, uh, translated, and perhaps some of their protein products as, are, are displayed as MHC-bound uh, peptides. Uh, so another sort of mantra in my lab is, you know, having corroborating lines of evidence. And so uh, the first thing uh, that... Uh, Chin Chin did was actually generate three different isogenic systems where HIF2 activity would be high or low. So she took a renal carcinoma cell line I alluded to a moment ago uh, that's VHL defective, and then she either reintroduced VHL to lower HIF, she treated with the HIF2 inhibitor to lower HIF, or she uh, introduced a guide to HIF2-alpha, which you can do at least in the short term if the cells are given enough serum. Uh, and she then did uh, RNA-seq. So uh, here's the RNA-seq data, uh, and I should point out, we're focusing on about 3,000 ERVs that have been annotated in the human genome as being reasonably intact. You may know that lots of other ERVs are so hopelessly fragmented and mutated, you, you couldn't imagine a way they would give rise to a peptide. But there are these 3,000 uh, ERVs that are relatively intact, where you could at least imagine them giving rise to a peptide. Uh, so here's the Venn diagram. I told you there was, those were those three uh, isogenic pairs. Let's just, for today's talk, be overly stringent, perhaps, and just focus on the 15 that scored in all three uh, comparisons. Well, uh, the first thing is it's always nice to have an internal control, even if you didn't know 
you had an internal control because we re-isolated the Richard Childs ERV. That was good. And then we also re-isolated an ERV that was the subject of one of those prognostication papers I told you about where people had noticed that high expression of three, uh, ERV 3.2 uh, correlated with the response to uh, immune checkpoint blockade. So then we did uh, CHIP-seq, and uh, again, we like to have multiple systems. So here we did this two different ways. Uh, so one way we did it was to do CHIP-seq with an anti-HIF2 alpha antibody in those cells where we did or did not eliminate HIF2 alpha. But I must say, if I had only had these two tracks, uh, I wouldn't have necessarily believed this signal. And parenthetically, this is, I'm showing you the Richard Childs uh, ERV here. So uh, he had reported a, a HIF binding site in this neighborhood, but I frankly would not have believed this. Uh, but fortunately, Nathan Ciroli in the lab had also knocked in a flag tag into the endogenous HIF2 uh, locus. And so that allowed us to do CHIP-seq instead with an anti-flag antibody. Again, I'm not showing you all the controls here, but uh, this is really quite specific to the cells that have the knock-in uh, tag. Uh, in fact, we're now so confident that we can say that the Richard Childs uh, binding site was probably wrong. His was over on this shoulder, but I think you can see the real binding site is probably here. But now with these data in hand, we can look at some of our other HIF responsive ERVs and see that in many cases they look just like the Richard Childs ERV. In fact, some of them have these beautiful flanking HIF binding sites on either side. Here's one called 5875. There are two functional HIF binding sites. Uh, here's another one called 4818. Uh, you see these functional uh, HIF2 binding sites. Uh, and so now we were getting a little bit more excited. Uh, so now we wanted to ask, are some of these really uh, translated and presented as peptides? So with, so with Sterling Churchman, uh, we did polysome seek, uh, looking for translated ERVs amongst our ERV set. And again, we're using pretty stringent cutoffs here, maybe too stringent, but suffice it to say, even with these very stringent cutoffs, asking for a neighboring binding site and scoring in polysome seek, you see the Richard Childs ERV and at least two more, those two I just showed you. Uh, so now we were ready to do uh, HLA mass spectrometry where we could immunoprecipitate the HLA complex from our renal carcinoma cells and look for bound uh, ERV-derived peptides. And, and this is a work in progress, I should caution, so this is early days. But suffice it to say, we have identified peptides from those two new ERVs I uh, alluded to a moment ago when I was showing you the flanking uh, chip-seq tracks or uh, flanking hip binding sites in, in the CHIP-seq. Uh, parenthetically, uh, the Richard Childs ERV would not be expected to be recovered in our cells because it's the wrong HLA type. Uh, and now with Carl Clauser and his team at the Bird Institute, we've now looked at 11 uh, kidney tumors from patients. And in six cases, we had normal controls. And again, I apologize for the busy slide. It's just to remind me that we're now up to 30-some-odd uh, ERVs that were amongst our initial set of potentially HIP-responsive ERVs if we lowered the threshold just a teeny bit. Uh, so we see a, a lot of these peptides. Uh, and in every case where we had normal tissue, the peptide was only present on the tumor and was not present uh, in the normal. So we're excited that someday maybe we'll have a lookup table of all the potential HIF-responsive ERV-derived peptides that you could see in different kidney cancers with different HLA types. And maybe this will eventually will lead to some sort of active or passive uh, immunization. Uh, the other thing I will tell you that we're excited about is knowing this now, we can go to other cancers, breast cancers, melanomas, brain tumors, treat them with those clinical grade HIF stabilizers and the ERVs go up 10, 20, 30 fold. So maybe that'll be useful too in terms of allowing the immune system to see them uh, as foreign. Okay, another gear switch. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears again. Uh, you know, I've been doing this for a while now. So there's no shortage uh, of high value genetically validated targets in cancer where they are deemed undruggable and everybody has their favorite list. Uh, of course, RAS might be about to leave this list, but certainly uh, the mic protein, beta-catenin, mutant P53, et cetera, et cetera, would be viewed as high-value targets in cancer, but they would also be deemed undruggable. Now, there are a couple approaches that you can imagine for going for undruggable targets in cancer, and in fact, the HIF2 story I share with you is an example of the first two. Uh, in some cases, you can simply go downstream and exploit epistatic, so-called epistatic relationships, so you might have said loss of a tumor suppressor like loss of VHL would be undruggable, but we can exploit this epistatic relationship that those cells are still dependent on HIF2. Uh, there's a renewed interest in allosteric inhibitors, and the HIF2 inhibitor is an allosteric inhibitor. Uh, I, along with many other people, have written uh, about exploiting synthetic lethal interactions. 
Think about treating BRCA mutant tumors with a PARP inhibitor. But what I want to talk to you about uh, now has to do with, with small molecule uh, degraders. So uh, our lab and Ben Ebert's lab working in parallel uh, several years ago showed that the thalidomide-like drugs, and they're referred to generically as IMIDs, actually work uh, by reprogramming a ubiquitin ligase, not the VHL ubiquitin ligase, but the Cerebon ubiquitin ligase, uh, to now target two transcription factors called IKZF1 and IKZF3, which are near and dear to multiple myeloma cells. And so this almost certainly explains, and we've done genetic experiments that support this, this almost certainly explains why these are wonder drugs for multiple myeloma. But I will, again, point out, historically, these would have been viewed as undruggable. Uh, now, almost immediately thereafter, Jay Bradner and Craig Cruz said, well, if you can do that, then you can start to chemically modify an inhibit so it would engage some other target. Uh, and in fairness, this really harkens back to the work of Ray Deshays and Craig Cruz uh, many years ago, where they envisioned the day where we'd have bifunctional small molecules that would recruit uh, your favorite E3 ligase, your favorite ubiquitin ligase, uh, to your target of interest. And just, uh, just to introduce some more horrible jargon, uh, these are sometimes referred to as molecular glues, uh, whereas these are often referred to as uh, protax. But the beauty of the molecular glues is they're much more drug-like than these larger, clunkier molecules. And for some reason, people thought these needed a name also, so they're sometimes called uh, degronomids. But if you think about it, uh, there are lots of ways a drug-like small molecule could change the stability of a protein because stability is, is so highly regulated. So we know that, for example, there are about over 500 ubiquitin ligases. We've talked about two today. Uh, there are about 100 d ubiquitinating enzymes. Uh, wh whether proteins are recognized by these ligases and dubs in turn is often affected by their folding and their post-transistor modifications and their protein-protein interactions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can imagine lots of ways a chemical could destabilize an undruggable uh, protein. So I hinted at this uh, earlier uh, when I showed you that soft agar assay. Uh, my lab hates down assays. We love up assays. And, and this is something that was drilled into my head 25 years ago by my friends in the pharmaceutical industry. And what they taught me was the obvious thing, things that, first of all, uh, up assays generally uh, have better signal-to-noise assays because it's easier to see a positive and a sea of negatives rather than the other way around, which is, of course, what makes astronomy possible. Uh, but more importantly for us, uh, there are more uh, uninteresting ways to make a complex system uh, work uh, worse than to make a complex system work better. And so whenever you do a genetic chemical screen and you're doing a, a down screen uh, or down assay, you just have this constant headwind of uninteresting things. And we, we wanted only interesting degraders. We didn't want uh, just plain old poisons. So to develop, to develop an up assay, uh, Sagar Kaduri in the lab uh, developed, I think, this clever reporter where your protein of interest is uh, fused to a modified uh, cytidine kinase that can accept a non-natural nucleoside, uh, BVDU for short, and turn it into a toxin. Uh, there's a little spacer, there's a little epitope tag. And, and then uh, the same transcript encodes uh, GFP, often iris. So the idea would be to add a chemical or genetic perturbant <clears throat> to add BVDU and then to look for green uh, survivors. And of course, I wouldn't tell you that uh, if it didn't work. So here's a proof of concept experiment that Sagar did. So this is a 384 well plate assay. Uh, here he's fused the uh, thalidomide target, IKZF1 to CK. Uh, each well here has a different chemical. I think you can see how easy it is to see the positives. I think uh, to my eye, there are at least three uh, positives. It turned out these were the two wells that had an image. Uh, and this turns out to be a, 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 a so-called assay positive that simply interferes with uh, BVDU uptake. So we know that now, so we, 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 we can discount it. So, uh, of course, he went to this trouble to find new degraders of IKZF1 and IKZF3. And I should point out that one mechanism of resistance to an imid, if you're a multiple myeloma cell, you can probably predict, and that is to get rid of Cerebon. So some myeloma cells simply silence Cerebon, and then they become resistant to the drug. So uh, Sagar was hoping to find new chemical matter. So the upper plate is the IKZF1 fusion cells. There's a counter screen of CK alone. Uh, you can ignore some of these columns, which have some controls that we don't have to talk about. Uh, suffice it to say that, for example, uh, here's a positive uh, that's an assay positive because it also scores here. And I should point out, otherwise, each row has uh, two different chemicals at 10 concentrations. So here at the highest concentration, this is an assay positive. Uh, but here's a true positive, and I, in the interest of time, I won't show you the data, but this is a true positive. It's a chemical that was originally called spoutin, uh, 
Uh, it was identified as an autophagy regulator, but that's probably a red herring here. Uh, but you see this very nice dose-dependent increase in survival, which in low-throughput assays correlates with degradation of uh, IKZF1. So we're sort of excited about that, and we're trying to understand the uh, relevant mechanism. Now, Ben Lampson in my lab, who is a physician scientist, uh, said, you know, I like these up assays, and I really like this suicide system you developed. Can I use it for some of my interest? So he decided to take the suicide gene I just introduced to you, but now place it under the control of the oncogenic transcription factor NF-kappa-B. So he is an NF-kappa-B responsive promoter, driving the expression of DCK, and again, there's a GFP off the same transcript. And then as a control, he has a constitutive promoter. Uh, and then the trick was to either add or not add uh, LPS, which is an NF-kappa-B agonist, and to then do a whole genome CRISPR screen to look for CRISPR guides that allowed you uh, to survive in the face of an NF-kappa-B ag agonist uh, by turning down the activity of NF-kappa-B. So I apologize that this is a, oops, this is a busy slide, uh, but for those of you who are not, again, used to looking at these, so I'm showing you here the volcano plots. Uh, so on the y-axis is uh, a measure of the probability that the hit is real. And if you've done these screens, uh, these are great p-values. Uh, and then over here are uh, genes that, when inactivated, confer a survival advantage, presumably because these are genes that, when inactivated, prevent NF-kappa-B from signaling. Uh, the things over here have the opposite effect. If I just blow up the most confident hits from this screen, uh, in one experiment, he got about 20 years of knowledge related to how NF-kappa-B uh, is signaled to by LPS. In contrast, here's the constitutive promoter, and basically the only interesting or true hit is, is, are the guides against DCK uh, itself. So uh, again, in, in one experiment, he basically outlined the signaling cascade from the LPS receptor, which is called TLR4, uh, all the way to NF-kappa-B itself. So that was great from a technological point of view, uh, but it would have been disappointing if he didn't discover anything new. But he did discover a couple new things. So amongst the hits uh, was an orphan uh, protein uh, or gene called CCDC134, uh, as well as an enzyme called STT3A, which is involved in the glycosylation of proteins in the endoplasmic uh, reticulum. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you that both of these are true positives. So what I'm showing you here is a blot for a tagged version of TLR4. And I should point out that for TLR4 to get to the cell surface properly, it has to be glycosylated, which causes this electrophoretic mobility shift. So now if we uh, inhibit this one uh, uh, glycol transferase or this orphan uh, gene, you see you block this glycosylation. Uh, as a control, it was already known that HSP90B1 was required for this glycosylation event. Uh, and I should point out, once again, this, I think, shows the power of doing an up assay versus a down assay, because a cynic would say, okay, you block glycosylation in the endoplasmic reticulum, big, you know, big deal, that probably makes cells very sick, but you can't be too sick to score in this assay. You have to survive and actually have a fitness advantage. And I would also point out that STT3B has a closely, has, now I'm getting back into New York speak, I apologize. STT3A has a closely related paralog, STT3B, which did not score in the screen. So this is really unique to STT3A. So it turned out there was a tool compound developed by Joe Contessa, which uh, blocks the activity of STT3A and its cousin, STT3B. And so if you treat cells with this inhibitor, you see a decrease in the glycosylation. Uh, and then over here, I remind you that our cells also express GFP under NF-kappa-B control. So if you treat with LPS, you activate the reporter. But now in the face of the inhibitor, you block the activation of NF-kappa-B. So once again, that's exciting, perhaps. But uh, I will also point out, in my view, this is, again, a down assay. And this is a down assay. So how would you know uh, this was specific? How would you even know this was on target? And we came to learn that there was even controversy as to whether this drug was acting directly or indirectly on the glycosyl transferase. So we decided we better do a better experiment. Uh, and this is a technology which, again, is a complete game changer for those of you who are not playing with it yet, but it's, it's just a complete game changer in my view. So we again collaborated with John Dench at the Broad to do now a CRISPR screen, but we're not doing a CRISPR activation screen. We're not doing a CRISPR inactivation screen. We're doing a CRISPR base editor screen. So we make a custom library to target S the STT3A locus, and then we have a dead Cas9 that's fused to one of two uh, 
highly uh, mutagenic enzymes that will mutagenize the locus once recruited to the locus. And so now uh, what uh, Ben did was to treat with DMSO or the inhibitor, then added LPS, and then he did facts to identify the persistently bright cells even in the face of the inhibitor, again leveraging the fact that NF-kappa B is driving uh, GFP. Uh, so uh, this worked very well. So here I'm showing you the STT3A uh, locus, but now numbering uh, amino acids. Uh, and each dot is a different uh, base editor guide and where it was uh, predicted uh, to map. Uh, and so anything around the zero is not being enriched. Uh, but anytime you see a dot uh, well above zero, that's a CRISPR base editor uh, that's being enriched and is allowing the cells to become uh, resistant uh, to the uh, STT3A inhibitor. Uh, in in low-throughput validation experiments, uh, Ben was able to confirm precisely which mutations the base editors had introduced into the STT3A locus. Uh, and then he tested in low throughput assays whether these mutants really did make the cells resistant to the inhibitor. So here, uh, again, I have uh, cell surface TLR4 by fax. So DMSO, TSO, uh, TLR4 is on the cell surface. You treat with the uh, STT3A inhibitor, and now the uh, TLR4 is no longer on the cell surface. But now, if the cells are expressing some of these putative drug-resistant uh, mutations, uh, now you can see that TLR4 once again gets to the cell surface, even in the face of the inhibitor. And if you don't like the facts assay, here's, here's that electrophoretic mobility assay where glycosylation uh, gives you this retarded schmear. Uh, and you can see with some of the drug-resistant mutants, uh, now these cells are resistant uh, to the compound. Now, one of the reasons I found this story very gratifying is it turned out, unbeknownst to us, that a number of the groups around the world had tried to solve the structure of this tool compound, this inhibitor, bound to STT3A, and it failed, and it failed, and it failed. And so they threw their hands up and said, it must be indirect, because that can be the only reason why we couldn't solve the structure. And we said, not only is it direct, we will tell you the residues that are touching the drug based on this base editor screen. So uh, fortunately, uh, Anna Ramirez and Casper uh, Loker and Zurich took the bait, and they went back and did a few more wrinkles to their purification schema. Uh, they did solve the structure of the inhibitor bound to the enzyme, and as we had predicted, the base editor screen had basically defined uh, the pocket. So in, in closing, I showed you this graph earlier. These were the phase two data. Uh, the phase three data read out a couple weeks ago, so the phase three trial was uh, positive, so we expect... Uh, these data to be presented at ESMO uh, later this year, and we hope it will now be approved for the treatment of sporadic uh, kidney cancer. But another truism in medical oncology is that most cancer drugs work better in the frontline setting than they do in very late lines of therapy. So we were able to convince Peloton and then Merck to treat 61 patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease who had measurable kidney tumors that had never been treated before. Because, and I should point out, these patients, because they develop so many tumors over time, are often put in careful surveillance programs where they'll get an MRI every three to four months uh, in an attempt to delay or prevent the need for repeated surgeries, which in the case of uh, the, the kidney would uh, uh, later lead them to be uh, uh, functionally a nephric. So here now, you can see the swimmer's plots look even better. Here's one year on therapy. Most of the patients are doing well. These data were updated recently. You can see most of the patients were doing well. And if you don't like the swimmer's plots, uh, here are the so-called waterfall plots. So now each vertical bar is a kidney tumor that was being monitored on this trial. And if you went below zero, the tumor shrank. So you can see four of the tumors went away completely. Uh, all of the tumors shrank to some degree. Uh, and 60 some odd percent achieved a so-called resist partial response. Now, even though you had to have a kidney tumor to get on the trial, uh, you could have other tumors associated with VHL disease. You could have amangioblastomas of your brain or eye. You could have pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, etc. So here are the waterfall plots for the CNS hemangioblastomas, and here are the waterfall plots for the pancreatic neuroendocrine uh, 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 tumors. Uh, and so again, this looks very promising. Uh, and perhaps most importantly and most gratifyingly, and I apologize again for the busy slide, so I showed you these swimmer spots before, but now in gray are the four years of observation before the patients went on the trial. So for four years, these patients had been monitored, and every time you see a triangle or a circle or a square, et cetera, 
that patient's going back to the operating room to have yet another tumor removed from their brain, their spinal cord, their kidney, eye, etc. And I think you can see that once they went on the HIF-2 inhibitor, the frequency of the operations went to almost uh, zero. Not quite zero, but getting close. And based on those uh, phase two data alone, the FDA did approve this drug for the treatment of uh, von Hippel-Lindau uh, disease. But I'm going to do a little bit of a mea culpa because, again, I was a clinical doctor when I was younger, and now I'm a cancer scientist. And so I know full well it's really, really, really easy when you see these cancer statistics such as these to forget that there's actually a real human being attached to each one of these bars or dots or whatever. And so I think to leave you with sort of a human face to this, uh, while the clinical trial was ongoing, uh, the VHL patients started posting on their social media sites. Uh, and fortunately, I have uh, young children, so they could teach me how to do this and find these social media posts. Uh, the, the patients were posting that they were responding. And you can imagine these patients have been living with the sort of Damocles over their neck because they've seen this disease ravage their family generation after generation, and they assume they would die uh, in midlife. But here's a patient saying, I never thought I'd see this day. And they were describing that their tumors were getting smaller, were stable, or in some cases had disappeared uh, altogether. And because everyone likes a movie, here's a short vlog that was sent to me by another one of the patients uh, on the trial. And I do have permission to show this uh, patient's uh, face. So we'll see if the audio works now. And the audio doesn't work. Okay. Update. I am in Louder. Right now. In uh, Taiwan, over there is Taipei 101. Uh, the gondola is actually right by the Taipei Zoo. But I just wanted to give you a quick update and uh, say I'm doing well. I'm enjoying my trip. If it wasn't for the PT2977 drug trial, I would have never been able to come out here and do what I'm doing right now. Um, so I just want to thank Peloton, and I hope Mark will fast track this drug for a VHL treatment. Um, so if you guys are listening, hopefully you guys will put it on the market to help VHL. But uh, yeah, keep uh, watching these videos. I'll be making more, and I'll, I'll get better at it. And I have to get the angles right because it kind of looks fat, you know. <laughs> so, so, Anyways, I, I, so okay. I, I love that because at that age, your biggest concern should be whether you look fat on your vlog and not whether your, your, uh, your next MRI is going to be so horrific your doctors tell you to get your affairs in order. Uh, and, and I am, since I think we're okay on time, just going to leave with one other last thought for the young people in the room. Uh, so uh, you know, I know progress can't come fast enough. I lost my own wife to a glioblastoma uh, in 2015. Uh, you know, I've spent the better part of my career trying to help with thousands of other people around the world push the field forward as we, we can with the knowledge that we have. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of cynicism in science, and there's certainly a lot of cynicism in clinical uh, oncology. And just to give you an example, some of you may have seen this picture before. Uh, this is a patient who had metastatic melanoma, and the melanoma had a BRAF activating mutation. Uh, and finally, these wonderful scientists at Plexicon made a highly potent, highly specific BRAF inhibitor. And, the, and these patients really do have sort of sometimes these Lazarus-like uh, remissions, and you know that's that's exciting. But the unfortunate truth is that many times the patients relapse. In fact, sometimes they relapse within a matter of months. Now, I, I was at a, a, a seminar that uh, Jim Watson gave at my institution several years ago, filled with lots of young people, many of whom, frankly, I think just wanted his autograph. Uh, but he proceeded to say things like uh, this: that uh, given the seemingly almost intrinsic genetic instability of many late stage cancers, we should not be surprised when key old timers and cancer genetics doubt being able to truly cure most victims of widespread metastatic cancer. And you can see the, the, the body language in the room, that people just kind of slumped in the chairs. And I'm thinking, you know, way to rally the troops, Jim. I, mean, I know if I was 25 years old and I heard this, I'd say, sign me up. Sign me up for that. Uh, because, you know, the great Jim Watson has said, uh, this isn't going to work. But what uh, Jim was, was never taught, but what I was taught in the 70s was the principles behind combination chemotherapy. So even in that patient who had those subcutaneous nodules, those little melanomas, you know, even a cubic centimeter tumor, some people estimate could have 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th cells. The tumor burden in most cancer patients is 10 to the 10th to, to the 12th cells. So even if you have a great drug like that RAF inhibitor, but one in a million cells are resistant, either genetically or epigenetically, you lose. The, the, the math doesn't work and you get the picture I just showed you. But we've known for decades that there's an answer. And the answer is to combine drugs that have distinct mechanisms of action, and because they have distinct mechanisms of action, hopefully their toxicities don't overlap in a prohibitive way, so you can give them at full doses. And more importantly, because they have distinct mechanisms of action, hopefully uh, they're not cross-resistant with one another. 
Uh, and so now, in, in a perfect world, the math can work for you. So if you combine three drugs where the probability of being resistant to any one of the drugs is 10 to the minus 6, and they're truly independent of one another, now the chance of any one cell being resistant to all three is 10 to the minus 18th. And, and now the math works. And uh, I will just leave you with a picture of what the, ter the treatment of tuberculosis looked like 100 years ago before the development of combination chemotherapy. We used to just send people up into the mountains and have them breathe uh, fresh air, so you can imagine how effective uh, that was. Uh, I was a medical house officer during the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, where we thought the, the urban hospitals were going to be overrun with AIDS uh, patients, but of course we got quickly to combination chemotherapy. And uh, I would argue it's almost certainly the case that in many of the cancers that we do cure, such as lymphoma and testicular cancer, it's because we got to combination chemotherapy. So I think we have to get to combination chemotherapy uh, as quickly as possible. So with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention. I hope I didn't go too far over.